Jeffrey Thomas, the author of A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Dealers, and you're watching Slasher Pepper. Enjoy. <laughs> hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another interview. This time I'm interviewing Jeffrey Thomas, the author of A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Dealers. How are you doing? Good. Hey, good. This, nice. <laughs> thanks for, <laughs> these are expensive, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the rarities. <laughs> so how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks for having awesome. me on. You're so welcome. Thanks for uh, being here. Sure. So my first question was, do you have any new projects coming up? I do. Um, so October 30th is the, uh, I think it's the official release date for my next novel, which is called The American. And it's a supernatural thriller that takes place in uh, modern day Vietnam. It, the, the, the novel actually covers 50 years, but it primarily takes place in uh, 2010 in Vietnam. And uh, it's like I said, it's a supernatural thriller. And uh, so, and, and then I have a short, couple short story collections coming out in the near future, but they haven't been officially announced yet. So I really can't say much about those. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Cool. And um, how did you get the job of writing The Dream Dealers? Oh, that, that was funny. Uh, I was contacted, uh, it was 2005, and I was contacted uh, by somebody, and they, um, they said they had, um, they, they had the rights to do original novels based on New Line cinema franchises, such as Friday the 13th, Jason X, Final Destination, and Nightmare on Elm Street. And they asked me if I'd be interested in writing an original novel based on one of those franchises. And at first, um, it, it, they, they were, had become aware of me, uh, you know, my writing. And so they were trying to get some, line up some talent. And uh, at first I was a little confused because I, that's not the kind of thing I do, write about somebody else's universe. And at first, and, uh, I, at first I didn't think I could do it, you know, but well, I only had a little bit of hesitation. And then I realized it could be a lot of fun. It'd be a great opportunity. And so I wanted to hear more about it. And so uh, they told me to pick one of those franchises and write like a proposal and, a, and an outline. And uh, so the first one I chose actually was I decided to write a Jason X novel uh, because I often in my stories combine science fiction and horror. And I thought Jason X, it was a fun movie. And I thought uh, that would be something that I could kind of have some fun with. So I, I wrote them a, an outline and a pitch and they liked it and, and they wanted to go with it, but they had some other Jason X books lined up first and they wanted to see how those did. Um, and, and, and as it turns out, the, the, the black flame imprint didn't go on much longer. Um, so I was never able to do my Jason X book. They were able to bring out a few more Jason X books by other people. But while I was waiting to hear if they were gonna green light that, they said, do you have any others you'd like to try? So I, I love, uh, you know, A Nightmare on Elm Street. And um, so I wrote a, a proposal about that. And one of the editors, a guy named Mark Newton, um, said, well, since you write, when you, since you combine science fiction and horror, why don't you set your Nightmare on Elm Street book a little bit in the future and maybe work in like some kind of futuristic technology? And I love that idea. And that's what I ran with. So I gave them that outline and um, they liked it. They green lighted it. And then they, they you know, so I, I could go ahead and write it. And so I already had the outline all set up for myself. So it was just a matter of sitting down and actually writing it. And it was, it was a great opportunity, like I said, and uh, a lot of fun. It was great. And yeah. um, why did you, um, what was your initial story for the Jason X books? Do you remember what your pitch was? Yeah, um, well, it, it involved, it involved a group of um, like outside, almost like a gang, a gang of young people. And I, I, and I don't remember, I don't remember all the details at the moment. I think there might've been cloning involved. Um, I do know that I took some of my ideas from that and I reworked them into uh, another story uh, that was, you know, that was re related to my own uh, original creations. But I did take some of those elements and, and recycle them, so to speak. Uh, it's, but I feel bad that I wasn't able to, um, to write that book. It would have been a lot of fun. That would have been fun too. Awesome. And, I, wish um, that, I wish the series had kept going, you know. That yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, I would have loved to have done more. I think Jason X um, has like a continuous timeline um, and five just kind of 
you know, just stops, you know, because um, I think it, it does set up like a sequel and stuff. But um, of course, we never saw another book uh, by Black Flame. Yeah. And other things that I was working on, um, there was a possibility for a while that they might get uh, Blade, uh, that they might be able to do original Blade novels, um, you know, the Blade the Vampire. Um, and so I, I started to write up a proposal for one of those. I think I was starting one for, for Final Destination, just, uh, and, and I was, had one, an idea for, for Friday the 13th. So I was just kind of you know, getting some ideas together, but I didn't go so far as to outline anything, but uh, I would definitely have pr proceeded with more projects if I'd been able to. Man, that's a shame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do know that Black Flame, I think they um, released the novelization of uh, Blade Trinity, like the third movie. I think they did that one uh, as a novelization. That would have been great if they, if they had Blade uh, sequels going on in book form. Yeah. Oh, that would have been a lot of fun. Yeah. So uh, the the publisher Black Flame was an imprint of Game Workshop, and they and they created a new line, a new imprint called Solaris Books, where they were just doing original science fiction and horror and what whatever. So even though I wasn't able to do another book in the Black Flame series, I they shipped it shifted me over to this other imprint, and I sold them two novels uh, for Solaris Books. Oh, nice. Yeah. So those were those were actually those three books were actually my my biggest selling books because they were mass market books you could find them in any bookstore and it was uh it was it was uh, a really good time those few years that i worked with game workshop in their various imprints does the other um publication still exist is it just like black flame that ran out of so, business or actually solaris books uh they sold solaris books the, the title to another uh company i think it's the company angry robot um but it, um yeah but they, so they they kind of pass that that imprint along and with new editors and so forth and I wasn't able to really ingratiate myself with them so I haven't done any further work with Solaris books well wow, that's too bad changed hands yeah yeah maybe I'll, I'll approach them with something else in the future yeah who knows hmm. and um what about the Nightmare on Street pitch the original one because you mentioned um someone else actually had the advice to yeah. have it said in the future what was your initial ID with that uh, book? I, I didn't have anything really at first. Uh, he came to, because he came to me right away and he said, uh, why don't you try Nightmare on Elm Street? Or maybe, I, I don't remember if I said I wanted to try Nightmare on Elm Street for, I think I probably ran it by him and said, why don't I do Nightmare on Elm Street? And he probably just came back to me. It's been so long now, it's been like 15 years. Yeah. This <laughs> conversation. But uh, uh, Mark, um, Mark said, why don't you take it a few years in the future? That's what you do, you know? kind of make it like a David Cronenberg thing with a little bit of technology and body horror and whatever. It's like, yes, that, that res really resonated with me. Um, the problem with me was though, that I don't write, I don't outline things before I write them. Uh, I like to write organically and let plots evolve on their own and, and discover it along the way, like the characters do. What's gonna happen, let the characters move around as they want to. Sometimes it works out well, sometimes it doesn't because sometimes you get a little lost. But I, 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 but I don't write outlines first. And so I didn't even know if I could do it. I got frustrated with that when they told me that that was a prerequisite. You have to write the outline first and you have to write a list of characters. What are their names? What are they about? And I'm like, how do I know what they're about until I start moving them around? <laughs> right. And so I, 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 like I said, I got frustrated. I thought, ah, maybe this isn't for me. But I, I start, started writing the outline for the, for the um, first for the, um, the Jason book. And um, I realized that as I started, I could do it. It was just like writing a story, except it was very bare bones. There was no flesh on it. But it's, it's still like you're writing a story. Um, so the, that turns out that I was able to work with that. And I, was, and I had to do that same technique. Uh, the same approach on the two Solaris novels that I did. Um, I've never done that. I've never done outline since. It's like I said, if, if I don't have to, I'd rather not work that way. But I made it work for myself. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like uh, writing and just having uh, this natural, you know, progress and coming up as you go, basically, um, is just the most fun way. Uh, but like you said, that's that's kind of also a uh, 
I guess, a risk taker because you never know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> right, right. Um, with my novel, The American, I was talking about before, I started writing that in 2010. That's why it's set in 2010. And um, I got about 60% of the way, roughly, into the book, and I got stuck. And I, 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 there were a couple of things that really held me back. And I, and I put it aside, and I didn't come back to it for nine years. Wow. So, so I, I, I didn't think, I was, I was starting to think I'd never be able to come back to it. And finally I did, and I read what I had, and I thought, if I could just get through this scene, and I did, and the rest of it just flowed forward. I wrote, I, I finished it in no time, submitted it, sold it in no time, and, and now it's coming out in about a, about a month, I guess. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, yeah, you know, that, that's the, that was the drawback of, the, of that organic process was that sometimes you can hit a, hit a wall. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, are, there, are there any events or characters in the book that are slightly based on anything from real life? Sure, sure. Um, there's probably so many tiny things, small things, that I wouldn't even be able to really, um, just little things like there's a character in there. Uh, I think her name is Emma. Um, uh, she's, she was based on a coworker of mine, um, little things like that. There was another character. I can't think of his name offhand, but I, I, I he was based on another coworker and he, the way he talked and everything, as I was writing this character, I was thinking of my friend, the way he talks, little things like that, the little, just countless small details that, that I steal out of real life. Right. Um, then, then I take other pieces from other sources, like uh, the character, last name is Carmack, uh, the main character, Devin Carmack. And, and I got that name Carmack by, from uh, John Carmack, who was one of the um, uh, co-founders of um, id Software, you know, that did Doom and everything. So, <laughs> so you know, you got the, the brothers in the, in, the, in the novel who are developing this kind of right. technology <laughs> that can record dreams and so other people can experience dreams through this device called the trance box. And I, so that, that's why I, I took that name, Carmack, from the, uh, the um, co-founder of, of Vid Software. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what's your perf uh, personal favorite Nightmare on Elm Street movie? It would be uh, I'd say probably first one but i'm also i also very fond of the dream warriors oh yeah but that one was that one was excellent you know and um i liked craig wasson's character and you know and patricia arquette was 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 really cute in that and everything and it was that one that one was very satisfying so it's it, it would be a, you know toss up between those two yeah for me it's probably um the first one as well but i also yeah. i'm a big fan of uh new nightmare i really love what wes craven did with that one seen that one and i and i really oh, i really, really? should yeah I, I think that's the only one i've never seen i don't know why it's Disturbed. so good well if what you, did you think of the uh the remake of nightmare on elm street i was just gonna say if you've seen a remake um then you definitely uh gotta give <laughs> <laughs> spend two hours on a uh, on new nightmare it's definitely two hours better spent <laughs> i i would i would think so the new the new one not uh, the the actor um who played Freddy? He, he's a he's a great actor. He did a great job, but um, the only thing that I thought was valuable was they um, they kind of like opened up a little bit more about Freddy's past, which was a little little bit interesting. But overall, I I just thought it was kind of lackluster. Yeah, and uh, totally unnecessary. In, in yeah, that too. You know, totally unnecessary. There are just some movies that you just don't really want to remake because you're never going to satisfy the fans anyways. But I feel like there are a lot of 80 slasher films that like really, if you remake them now and, and set them in like a modern time set, I think you can do some really interesting things with it. Say uh, Alice, Sweet Alice or, or um, you know, the 1980 Intruder. It's my favorite movie. So, um, but I still feel like it could be a really interesting and cool remake. I'm not even sure I've seen that one. I'll have to check that out. That's your favorite film? Yeah, Intruder from 1989. Oh, interesting. But I'm it's it's looking. like there are no iconic characters in there or or actor or uh, characters played by actors where people are just like you can't replace them like with Robert England as Freddy Krueger, you know. Yeah. Um change up a few things and you could do a great remake, but with Nightmare on Elm Street that's just impossible really to satisfy anyone. 
there are, there are films that, uh, that really shouldn't be touched. Um, then there are those like uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly, John Carter's right. The Thing, where the remake was uh, superior. And, and, and it, because they put a different spin on it was one of the main reasons that those were. Exactly. Uh, but, but for the most part, I'm really uh, leery of, of remakes. I just heard that they're going to make a, a do a remake of um, Stephen King's Firestarter, and it's not, it's not a movie where it's so great that you don't want a remake of it. But it's just at this point, it's like why why do you have to keep remaking every Stephen King right. movie? Why don't you make a Jeffrey Thomas movie? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I also um, um, I was on this podcast recently where we talked about Alice Sweet Alice, and um, we actually came up with um, with a different plot twist and a different um, killer at the end. And it was like, wow, this is honestly a better plot twist than it is in a movie. This would be great in a remake, you know? Um, but like you said, with The Thing and The Fly, those movies that came before weren't really classics, you know, set real high. Um, they, were, they, were, they were very good, but the, but the, the, the remakes were superior. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, I'm one of the people that some people are torn about Suspiria. I'm, I'm one who feels that the remake of Suspiria was superior. And I'm sure some people wouldn't agree with me about the remake of Cat People from 1982, Paul Schrader's remake of, of the classic. Uh, the, again, the, the first original movie was, was great, but I personally prefer the Paul Schrader. Yeah, for me, uh, I also prefer the, the Blob remake from the 80s. Yeah. Maybe it was that time period where the, when the remakes were better, but now, I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the Evil Dead remake was, uh, was pretty cool, too. Like the 2014 cool, one. I, I liked it, but I just felt, again, it was, it was unnecessary. But I, I, it, was, it was not terrible, though. No, I like that they did something different with it, you know. And um, what do you think hell looks like? I've written a whole series of stories uh, about about um, hell in my vision of hell. Uh, it, I started with my novel Letters from Hades, and I've written a number of a couple of novels and a bunch of short stories in in my Hades world. You know, they're all consistent with each other in that universe. Um, that being said, I don't believe in 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 hell myself. I don't believe in 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 an afterlife of that of that type. Um, but I guess uh, my hell and, and my stories, it's, it's not too different from our world. So I guess that kind of, I, I find our world hellish enough. In my hell, my, my hell world, people have jobs and they go to their jobs. They, can, they live in cities. And so it's just like, he, it's just like our lives. It just kind of amplified. The, 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 the anxieties and the horrors are amplified. All right. So no uh, fire and and the throne with uh, Satan. No, it. <laughs> no, no. I in my um, in my version of hell, in my fictitious version of hell, there is no Satan. Um, there's only God, and God has his his uh, his the people he he favors and the people he he doesn't favor, and so everything comes from him, and and he's responsible for the suffering in hell and everything. If you don't, you know, bow to his, you know his conception of, of, of what how people should behave or whatever so it's more of a commentary not on it's not a criticism of, of a god that i don't necessarily believe in but it's a criticism of human attitudes and how humans impose their um ideas on others and, and repress others with their uh, control control of the people not to say i don't necessarily believe in god i but i'm ag more agnostic than an atheist. I, I believe in the possibility, but I just don't. Oh, yeah. If there is a God, I don't. Or in an afterlife, I don't believe it's it's how it's spelled out. In yeah, I, I'm 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 an atheist myself, but I'm I'm open for the uh, opportunity. You know, if, <laughs> if if some God decides to walk down from up there to me and uh, tell me um, that he does exist, you know, I'll believe in it. You know, so um, yeah. but I haven't seen him so yet, so. I'll just wait for that day. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I am more than skeptical, but uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. I, I try to keep an open mind. Yeah. Yeah, which which I wish more people did nowadays. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And um, if you could get, could get rid, it's kind of along the lines of our conversation at this point, if you could get rid of one thing in the world, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, I would be very tempted to say religion. Um, <laughs> I, I, I might have to say religion because I, I would be tempted to say money, but I mean, how, what are you going to, what kind of system are you going to create to replace that? Um, you know, like a Star Trek utopia or something, which is, it's not something that could be achieved at any time quickly. Um, you can't eradicate government as much as you, you, you might be disgusted with government. Um, because again, it's something that you need to, for civilization, but I don't think we need religion. I think people could, could deal with their lives without religion. And I, and religions tell you that you're the chosen one and this one over here is going to hell. So if they're going to hell, their, their life has no value to you because they're gonna, they're bound for eternal damnation. So this whole group of people you're, 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 you're perceiving as, as um, worthless. They're, they're, they're not the chosen ones like yourself. So religion to me fosters hatred yeah more so than it fosters brotherhood and so i i really think that people could could uh, um do without it yeah i feel like religion and and politics are just like the um, the main sources for for like arguments and hatred nowadays you know it's it really gets uh so exhausting and it's spiritually exhausting I, I guess it's kind of ironic that I speak in the manner of spirit, but I guess I'm just speaking, you know, figuratively. Um, I, I, that being said, I, I am open-minded about other people's beliefs, and I try not to impose my lack of belief on them, um, as long as they're respectful of, of, of me as well. Exactly. It's getting harder and harder to respect other people's political beliefs, but I, but again, I try not to, I try not to get into that in, in social media. It's, it's so oh, no, exhausting to enter into. <laughs> yeah. After I just, just closed my Twitter account because of the, the, the it's so toxic on Twitter. I just Twitter. Couldn't, couldn't, get, <laughs> couldn't deal with it anymore. So I closed that. And, but I, but I maintain a Facebook presence. Yeah. I mean, Facebook, you know, if, if you're in, in like um, horror groups or, or stuff like that, you'll see, just horror stuff and usually one of the rules is is just keep your religion and politics out of here <laughs> well people still do it though yeah, yeah they still, they, they, people, they, they, well if, if they do it in my group they can't be removed any sooner <laughs> that's good that's good see we need a break from it sometimes yeah you know? exactly yeah i mean if, if someone really likes to talk about it because there are people that really just love to talk politics and, and religion um more power to you but you know, you, not around me, okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, it's not within the scope of, of that group. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, what's some advice you would like to give to young and upcoming authors? Um, I would encourage them uh, to, to read widely, not just within a particular genre. There are people who not only read in only in a particular genre, but within a subgenre. Like there are people who like only read Lovecraft type of horror instead of like a broader range of horror or a broader range of fiction. I think if you're going to be a writer, um, you should read really as, as much different kind of stuff as you can, as long as you find it enjoyable. You don't want to read something that's not going to, you know, you're not going to find it enjoyable. But I don't only read horror. I don't only read science fiction. Uh, I do primarily read fiction as opposed to nonfiction. Um, but I, I, like right now, I'm in the middle of, um, well, I'm actually toward the end of Moby Dick. It's a great American novel. I feel like uh, obligated to read it. And it's a wonderful novel. And um, so um, I don't just read horror. I just don't read science fiction. And, and so I, that, that would be advice I would give. I'm also depressed sometimes when I see how people want to be a writer, but they don't seem to be reading too much of anything, let alone outside of a genre. They seem to think that they can master the, the, the skill of writing without reading voraciously. And I don't see how that's possible. You've got to read, read, read. That's, uh, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. Because maybe, maybe like in a different genre, it's written like differently. And maybe that type the, or the way it's written will get you an original idea that's like, just never done before in horror, you know, who knows? Exactly. You can, you, you can draw so much inspiration from uh, 
the, uh, the way an, another writer, their prose voice, their, the way they construct a plot, the way they paint uh, a setting, the way they establish a character. You can, you can learn uh, so much from other genres and, and bring those skills in and combine them. And your work is only going to be enhanced by that. You're just, you're just putting more tools in your toolkit. Right, for sure. Um, is there anything you would like to add to the interview? Um, just, uh, just that I'm, I'm glad that people are still asking me about this book. You know, I, I've done, over the years, I've done a number of uh, interviews about it. Um, it. It was cool because I, I on the, the, there's a the documentary, Never Sleep Again, that was made about Nightmare Oh, Street. yeah. And it came with a, um, like an extra, DVD extras. And in the DVD extras, they interviewed me. About, nice. about the book so it was, it was cool and so I've done a couple of interviews over the years and it's exciting to me that even though this is long out of print um, that people are still interested in it and still saying nice things about it you know that you, you wanted to talk to me about it and so it, that's that's very re rewarding oh yeah for sure I can imagine I just wish that it that people could get it more cheaply and I, <laughs> the last time I, I looked at this earlier tonight on uh, Amazon it was 150 dollars which is actually kind of cheap compared to how we you know I just wish I had bought a bunch of these back in the day. I could be selling them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you had a hundred copies, you'd be a millionaire by now. <laughs> well, they sent me a big box of them originally. And I don't know. I probably just gave them away to <laughs> friends and whatever. I mean, you, you didn't expect them to be 150 bucks on Amazon in the future. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, to anyone that is interested, I know you know about the channel. Um, I'm actually drinking my coffee from his mug right now the 80 slasher librarian actually has um has all of uh or mo yeah all of the black flame books available as uh audiobooks on his channel so if anyone wants to check that out make sure you do it's cool that he does that so that it, 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 get, it gives people an opportunity to experiences yeah. who, who really are not going to have any other way to do so it's not something i can re-release again on my own because of just contractual right you know uh, restrictions Right. I'm, I'm surprised they even went out of business because uh, these books seem to be pretty popular, but maybe it's like a cult following thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's hard to keep any kind of a publishing venture going, especially with people's attention shifts and, and whatnot. And, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, is there anything else you would like to add to the interview? No, I guess I'm pretty good. I, again, I just thank you for, you know, expressing interest in, in, in this book and, and having me on to talk about, you know, my, my, my book, The American, coming out soon. Uh, I hope people would be interested in checking that out. Yeah, I'll put a link uh, in the description to uh, the cool. books. Cool. Right. Oh, I guess that about sums it up. So um, thank you guys so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Oh. You're pissing me off, Roger. It's gonna be wild tonight.